Um, wanted to thank everybody for coming today and wanted to thank our alums for sharing their experiences with us. Um, we're gonna start off by asking uh, each one to give us their bio. So um, Megan, do you wanna start? Sure. Uh, hi everybody, my name is Megan Armistead and um, I was in Epic in 1996, holy moly. Um, and the, the topic that year was religion and world politics. So it's funny that it's sort of something that has stayed a theme in my career too. Um, uh, after Tufts, I worked for a couple of years for an immigrant rights organization and then was a Peace Corps volunteer in Haiti. Um, Following that, I went to graduate school at Hopkins at SICE at the School for Advanced International Studies. And since then, I've had a pretty standard career in international development. I spent about eight years working um, with Lutheran World Relief, largely overseas, as a technical advisor, working with local organizations and partners on transitioning to more locally led development and humanitarian response. And localization and civil society has been sort of my topic area for a long time. I've been with Catholic Relief Services for about seven years, um, doing similar programmatic work for a long time, also looking at larger program quality and impact issues. And in recent years have made somewhat of a transition to a more policy position where I look at how we can better connect evidence, our programmatic evidence with um, influence and, and policy uh, engagement with policymakers and donors around what works and what doesn't work in development and humanitarian response. Great. And did nice you work story. on the ground in other in other countries? Yes. So I was overseas based in Kenya for a few years and based in Uganda for a few years, but I've also done um, other short and medium term work in Burkina, Niger, Mali, Nigeria, Tanzania, <laughs> South Sudan, and I think that those are the major ones, plus Haiti, going back and forth to Haiti a bunch. So, um, so yes, I've had both on the ground experience as well as sort of the headquarters experience too. Great, great. Mm -hmm. Rachel? Sure. I never, when someone says they've had a standard career as an EPIC alum in international development, I don't believe them. <laughs> I was right not to believe you when you said that. Um, I'm Rachel Brandenburg. I did EPIC in... 2002, I believe, um, sovereignty and intervention was the topic, which sort of encompassed everything and anything you wanted to talk about around the globe. Um, for me, EPIC really was the beginning of the rest of the career I've had so far in international relations and international security. I um, came into Tufts as a diehard pre-med student who lasted about halfway into my first semester of sophomore year, and I was like, oh, IGL is more interesting. Um, so it did EPIC, started focusing on the Middle East, and ended up majoring in international relations um, until about a year and a half ago. I actually have continued focusing on the Middle East since. Um, I spent the first couple of years after college mostly overseas. I did a fellowship in Brussels in a small think tank there, focused on Middle East EU relations, and then did a Fulbright in Israel um, the following year and then came back to DC in 2007 for grad school at Georgetown at the School for Foreign Service, where I focused on their broad sort of foreign policy and international security degree. Um, focus areas have changed, just changed since a bit and the program has changed a bit, but, um, and then I thought I'd be in DC for two years for grad school and then get out of here again. And 13 years later, I'm still here. Um, so I've spent much of the time since um, working in the executive branch. I spent a couple years at the State Department, um, focused on the Middle East, just as the um, then called Arab Spring was happening. So worked in an office that was focused on uh, US assistance to some of the transition countries and specifically Tunisia spent some time at the U.S. Institute of Peace, um, working on their North Africa program, their Syria program, and then their Israel-Palestine program. And then in 2014, went to the Pentagon, um, where I joined the counter-ISIS team as the U.S. government was trying to figure out what we were gonna do about ISIS, um, and was part of the Iraq side of the counter-ISIS team, and then um, managed our bilateral relationships with some of the Levant countries uh, until I left 
there in January 2018. Um, so saw sort of the first year of the Trump administration. Left the Pentagon thinking I'd take a break for a few years and went to a think tank um, called the Atlantic Council. And then about a year and a half ago, went over to Capitol Hill to join now Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin as her senior policy advisor focused on defense and foreign policy issues. I had worked for her at the Pentagon when she was Assistant Secretary of Defense, so sort of pulled back into her orbit and I'm now learning how Congress generally works or is supposed to. That's it. Nice, thank you, thank you. And Rachel was one of the co-founders of NIMEP, which has become Merge as part of uh, the evolution at the IDL. No longer new. Yeah. <laughs> Amy? Hi, I'm Amy Kalfus. I graduated from Tufts in 2013 with a degree in international relations. I did EPIC in 2012, focusing on conflict in the 21st century, and then was also a member of Allies. And that was really pivotal in my career. That was, I knew I wanted to work in IR, but it was really being involved with IGL that exposed me to so many other practitioners in the field and really solidified that for me, what it would look like as a career. Um, after I graduated, I did my field work in India, um, looking into anti-human trafficking work, and then came back to DC for about four years, um, working with the Atlanta Council, the State Department. I worked for the US Institute of Peace on Afghanistan and Pakistan for a few years. And then right before grad school, um, worked at the International Republican Institute, where I led a global network of young human rights and democracy activists in about 75 countries around the world. So it's a really fun job. I got to travel to each continent, meeting young leaders and seeing what they were doing to shape civic engagement and human rights around the, glo around the globe. Um, and then most recently, just graduated from Georgetown um, with a Master's of Science in Foreign Service. So the same program as Rachel. And there I focused on global politics and security, um, which essentially covers foreign policy, but also dabbles in international development, a little bit of finance, um, very similar to the international relations degree at Tufts. Great, thank you guys. So um, now, since we're kind of focusing on grad school, I want to go around and see if you want to talk about, you know, your experience, like when you decided to go to grad school, why you decided to go, and kind of how you felt like coming out of it, you know, what did it give you? And, and also kind of talking about the, both the hard and soft skills that you take away from grad school. Um, Megan, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so I probably always thought I would want to go to grad school. Um, I, I, I felt like I was probably going to want to learn some more after graduation, but I wasn't quite ready um, right after graduation. So I worked for a couple years and then, but it was really as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, I was a volunteer in Haiti and I was actually one of the first NGO development volunteers. And my, um, my assignment was to work with um, small community-based credit unions. And in doing that work, I mean, it was tremendous. It was a tremendous opportunity to learn about development kind of at the grassroots village level. Um, but I also realized some gaps in my understanding of development processes. And so I think that I, I had two motivations for grad school. One was, um, you know, just wanting to learn more and to and and that it was probably going to be something that I would need for my career, um, but also I really had a sense that there was there were skills and things that I needed to learn to be effective in in development work. And in particular, I felt like economics was a big gap in my education. I had very much a humanitarian, I mean, uh, sorry, humanities background. Um, history and social sciences and English had been kind of my formation. But in working with these credit unions and diving into the world of microfinance at that point, I realized that I really needed to understand sort of basic economics and economic systems to understand development as a process. And so um, when I started to look at international development programs, um, I was lucky enough to have a, um, my country director in Peace Corps kind of pointed me in the direction of SICE, but I also looked at Fletcher um, and at a couple of other programs. But I, in looking at them, I realized that I did want that economics background. So the SICE um, program 
even if you do a concentration on development or on security or on any other aspect of international relations, you also have to do essentially another degree in economics. So you have to do at least six courses um, in intermediate and economics or above. And so I knew that was going to be very challenging for me, but I also felt like if I was going to invest the time and the money in um, further study that I wanted to, to come away with um, some skills and some new ways of looking at the world that I wasn't able to do just from like reading more on my own. So, um, so I think, uh, and when I went, I did find it quite a learning curve. Um, it was tough to be in a different kind of environment. It was, um, it was, it was an incredibly rigorous program. Um, there's a lot of math that I had not done for a long time <laughs> on the econ side. Um, and the development program itself, at that time, it was called Social Change and Development. And it was also very rigorous. Um, I think having training, like sort of active training in the field of study, especially if you've had a little bit of exposure to that field beforehand, um, was it an amazing opportunity to just be able to like throw yourself in and catch up on the conceptual frameworks that under undergird all of your, um, all the things that you've observed in, in practice. And then also, um, to just be in a community of people that are also super, super interested in the same issues that you're interested in. Um, and when I reflect on, it's funny because I don't actually use the econ as much as I would probably have thought I would or would have would like to, but it still gave me a, a d much deeper understanding of the role of markets in national development processes, for example, that help give a context for if I'm looking at organizations you know, in West Africa that are struggling with community economic development, having a, a basic fluency with, you know, macro and micro economic concepts, as well as development frameworks and kind of a history of development, what it continues to be really helpful. I also think having a program that was actively holding itself to high standards of rigor um, helped tremendously in developing some stuff, not soft skills, but functional skills. So um, having to learn how to do things like, I mean, these were skills that I actually probably started practicing with Epic, come to think of it, but like having to read huge quantities of material in a week, you know, that you can't really possibly do, but learning how to skim quickly, do quick analysis, turn out, write a lot. Um, I have been, those are the kind of skills that I think I use every day, probably still. So analytical skills, critical thinking skills, writing. Um, would all be things that um, I think graduate school was incredibly helpful for. Is that is that helpful? I don't know if I missed any big pieces of your questions. Maybe just add. Um, did you was it, it was a two year program? It was a two year program full time. Um, and the summer was that an internship or was that? I'm sorry, say that again. For the summers, was it an for the internship? summer? Yep, for an internship, I actually got an internship from my former country director for Peace Corps, who had moved from Haiti to Nigeria, and I yeah. got to work for her on a uh, USAID project um, mm -hmm. on civil society in Nigeria at the time, so also very helpful. Um, graduate school is not also, a, you know, a light decision, though. I, I will say transparently, because I think it's important for people who are thinking about it, that I took on quite a lot of debt to go to grad school. Um, for me, it was totally worth it. Um, because I, I ended up with skills that I really needed, with a degree that was really helpful in my field, and with skills that I still call upon every day, um, and also because I, I, I'm still in very close touch with all of my peers from, from my cohort, so it's a community that I've definitely, a network that I definitely still lean on, but it's not to be taken lightly. I mean, it's a, it was definitely an investment, um, so. I think that's also a consideration gotcha. for many. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Rachel? Sure. Um, so I also looked at some of the same programs. Uh, the primary reason I didn't opt for SICE was precisely the reason that Megan did. <laughs> I was very uh, intimidated by all of the math and econ. <laughs> Georgetown at the time, you only had to do two semesters of finance and trade, not however many. Um, so 
I, having spent the first couple years after college overseas, sort of knew I wanted to come back to DC, um, knew I wanted to work in the policy world somehow, didn't really know what that looked like, thought maybe government, and kept finding that the only jobs I came across were sort of uh, entry level jobs, doing things that didn't seem so interesting, uh, which I'd probably have to do for a while. Um, and to me, I really wanted to learn more than I felt like I could from those positions, um, and particularly how the US government works. I think as someone who was focusing on the Middle East at the time, the US was a big player, um, for better or worse, not all for good, but in a way that I wanted to understand and I wanted to somehow uh, be a more active participant in. So I looked at schools as a way to sort of go back to learning, though I didn't, it wasn't that long that I was out, only two years between undergrad and grad school. Um, and also is to kind of try and see what I could, um, what I could bite off in sort of US foreign policy making and then uh, turn that into a job somewhere in DC. I thought pretty much until I decided to go to Georgetown that I really, really wanted to go to Fletcher. Um, I think for many students still probably, it's this really cool institution while you're an undergrad um, and it is a really cool institution that does a lot of good things and has a lot of good people. But as I was choosing between schools and kind of looking at the course load, I realized I was familiar with the professors at Fletcher. I was familiar with the courses at Fletcher. And so I really wanted something new. Um, and that was a large part of my decision to go to Georgetown, um, see what I could get out of being back in DC um, and see what kind of experience I could gain that way. I had a fabulous time. It was a great program. Um, a lot of what Megan said was true there sort of the network you build, the community you build um, are both really enjoyable and have for me been very valuable considering I did go into sort of the US policy space. I have run into a number of alumni from my program, um, a number of professors who kind of came in and out of government over the last 10 years. Uh, and a lot of my friends have become my colleagues. Um, I have also found that a lot of the skills that we learned are really things that I have done in practice. So I only had one paper in two years that was longer than five pages. And it was like a 10 or 12 page research paper. Uh, everything else were memos or briefings or speeches. Um, our comps, our comprehensive exams were oral, not written. And they really did emphasize teaching you some of those sort of the harder, not really hard skills, but um, the skills that you need in government work more than sort of the research that you would need in an academic institution or otherwise. Um, so that I found very valuable. I do think um, I was glad I had some experience outside of school before I went back to school. I was on the younger end of my classmates. Uh, many people had been out for five plus years and decided to come back to grad school either because they were redirecting their career or had decided at some point um, along the way that they wanted to enhance what they were doing through a graduate education. I think the little bit of experience I had was really helpful, but having any experience is very valuable. Um, both the desire to go back to school and sort of appreciate what you're getting in those short two years and the perspective that all the students brought from their own experiences outside the classroom, I think really did enhance the conversations we had and the things that they brought to the conversation, I mean, to the, um, to the classes in a way that was useful as a peer to hear from, but also for myself, um, useful to have some of that perspective going in. I think one of the other things um, that was important to me was, and this goes to what Megan was saying too, it is an investment of your time and your money. So important to do it because you know what you want to get out of it. Um, I think grad school seems like an easy default. I thought about it the year I graduated college, the year afterwards, <laughs> quite a few times as kind of, oh, let me just go back to school. Um, but it is, I think you get the most out of it if you know what you want from it and if you know where you want to go from it. Um, and that doesn't mean knowing that like, I want to finish grad school with X job. Um, I actually had a professor say to me along the way, if you still want to do exactly what you thought the day you started by the day you finished, you probably haven't learned enough. Um, so exploring and changing your mind and all of that is part of it, but at least knowing where it's going to get you before you invest that sort of chunk of your life, uh, I think is something to think about. Great. 
Great, thanks. And, and Rachel, for your summer in between? Um, I did a critical language scholarship in Jordan studying Arabic. Gotcha. Great. Great. Amy? Yeah, so I think I'm kind of a unique case in that I knew I wanted to go to grad school from a young age. In fact, I actually chose Tufts because I wanted to have access to Fletcher and take Fletcher courses early on and then just, you know, go to Fletcher for my MALD. Um, that changed though when I was a student. Um, as I started talking to alums from the different graduate schools throughout internships and just different experiences, I realized that I really needed to have professional experience for these programs going in. And so I decided to put that on hold, keep researching grad schools and go work abroad and in DC. And I'm so glad that I did. Um, as the others have said, it really is so important for these programs. Um, at Georgetown, for example, we had a class of about 120 students and I'd say maybe five came out of undergrad. And then the rest had really just very rich experience living abroad, working in foreign ministries. I mean, really, you name it. And that was critical because most of your discussions in your classroom will be you sharing your personal experiences as a manager, living in a certain country, dealing with a certain culture. And that is what adds so much richness and depth to it. So I would definitely say, get as much experience as you can. Um, with that said though, there is a plateau, I think, that most people face. Um, after a few years of working in DC, I noticed that about maybe 80 to 90% of jobs required a master's. DC in particular is really saturated when it comes to high level degrees. Um, and so it can just be very competitive. I felt like um, I wouldn't be able to move past, you know, the first few levels without a master's. That's usually once you get to program assistant, program specialist, there's usually around the program officer level, I'd say you need a master's degree. I also knew that I needed to get new skills, but also I wanted to make a bit of a career transition. In my case, I had worked with a lot of government and nonprofits, and I wanted to learn more about the private sector and the social impact space. And for that, I really knew that I needed quantitative skills. I needed to learn more about econ and finance and develop significant hard skills. So it was at that point with about four years of experience, I decided to go back and get my master's. And I love my experience. Um, I don't just say this because this is an IGL event, but I often tell people the two best things I did for my career were Epic and doing my master's program at Georgetown. I, I love the experience. They were some of the best two years of my life. I mean, it was really just a great experience, um, but a lot of research went into it. I, as the other panelists have said, it's not something to take lightly. It's a lot of money, a lot of work, and it really is something that you should research because it's not just the two years of experience and the skills you're getting, but the network you're gonna have for the rest of your career. And so it's really important to be thoughtful. Um, as I was making my decision, again, I had loved Fletcher, but um, I decided ultimately to go to Georgetown. And I'd say there were a few sort of key things that shaped my decision. Uh, the first was size. I, after experiencing Epic and the IGL, I knew that I really loved a smaller community environment where I could get to know my peers, get to know my professors, and I wanted a smaller program. Um, location was a major factor. I knew after talking to people that I would likely build my network and stay and work in the city where I went to school, although there's a few exceptions. Um, like I know often Fletcher people come back to DC or, or move out of Boston eventually, but um, in general, I knew I wanted to work in DC. And so I knew in DC in particular, networking is so critical. I wanted to use those two years to build a network um, for after school. Um, although I did also look in the UK and a few places abroad, I decided on DC. Um, quantitative analysis. I'm not a math person, but I knew that I needed quant skills. And so for me, it was kind of figuring out exactly what I needed. And my professional experience helped me to figure out specifically what I needed. Um, so things like stats, um, f international finance, economics, micro macro, 
um, learning about social impact, impact investing, how the private sector works in international development. Some of those skills were very valuable. And then really the last piece for me was work-life balance. I knew that I wanted to have access to internships or jobs. I was in a full-time program, but just to have access to those things as an option while I was in school or um, maybe a research assistant position um, while I was in school. And that's something I did end up doing and really enjoyed. Um, so those were the key factors for me. In terms of what I got out of it, um, there were definitely specific skills um, that I think were very valuable. Um, as Rachel said, things like memo writing and oral briefing were really important. Um, our professors would always say, um, you know, you need to learn to brief your boss or your principal on the walk to the elevator. So we would literally have classes where um, we'd come in, first thing she'd do at the beginning of the day is point to one person and say, give me a 60 second briefing on X headline in the news this morning, what's happening? Why is it important for US foreign policy and what should we do? And that was just the training that we had every day to be able to talk fluently about current events and what's happening around the world. Um, quant skills were important, monitoring and evaluation and impact analysis, and then also leadership skills, I think, and management skills were really helpful. Um, so ultimately, it was a great experience. Um, the last thing I would say is think carefully about the network you're going to build. So one way you can do that tangibly now is looking at um, a list of the companies where most alums end up. That'll give you a sense of whether they're in the public sector, private sector, nonprofit sector, and then do really careful research on the professors you want to work with. Who would be your academic advisor? Who could be a mentor for you? Because those professors, as I found today, aren't just advising you, you know, academically or teaching you in a class, they actually become your recommenders for jobs when you graduate and they become lifelong contacts and friends, you know, after you're done with grad school. So think carefully about not only um, what types of classes you want, but what individuals you can be mentored by while you're there. Great, great. Um, one of the questions is about when you were interacting with your, uh, the professors or the people who you were teaching you, did you look at the difference between like the people who were there for an academic career, people who were there as practitioners, you know, and the balance of that, you know, people who had the experience out in maybe what you wanted to do versus people who were teaching about it and how important that was for you? Jump in on Never that. <laughs> yeah. I, um, as you were asking that, I was thinking about who were my professors, and I think actually only one of them was an academic first versus a practitioner first who taught also. Um, and this might be unique to these kinds of programs, maybe DC and some of the professionally oriented programs where they do draw people who have been in and out of government for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, that one professor who had an academic background, did actually go serve in the NSC uh, under Obama in the second term. So he did end up getting some of that practical experience he was teaching us about, but he was my like international relations professor in mm -hmm. grad school. So he wasn't the one who was talking to us about experiences. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty much every other professor was teaching based on their own experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of them had written books, so they taught to their books too. Um, but I was interested in a place that I could learn from people's experiences and not just sort of textbooks. Um, I think it was Megan who said in talking about her thinking about grad school, um, I didn't, I wanted something more than I could learn from reading books myself. Mm -hmm. And so part of that for me was looking for the professors, um, like Amy said, and also choosing a focus area that was different from something I had done. For me, I had been focused on the Middle East. I knew I wanted to keep focusing on the Middle East, but I intentionally chose a program that was much broader than that, um, where I felt like I could get things I couldn't otherwise find myself. Yeah, maybe if I can add to that, I, I felt very similarly. Um, I think probably the, the DC, these schools in DC are especially practitioner um, rich uh, because people are sort of coming in and out of practical experience. I think 
I mean, it was, it, it was perfect training for being a practitioner. I think, you know, to have people who have wrestled with these kind of problems yeah, um, in multiple settings and in different ways was really rich. I think that's probably a good question for people to think about as they're thinking about DC, I mean, about graduate school. You know, do you really want to hone your research skills and like go into the world of academia or are you looking for kind of hard practitioner training? Um, because at one point I thought about switching from being a practitioner to being more, going down a more academic road. And I realized that I probably would have had to have different training or retrain in a certain way to go that route. I mean, I had, I did take classes like practical research methods and, and basic stats, but I didn't have, you know, the kind of um, research formation that you would have if you did a PhD program, for example. So I think it's um, that, I think the practitioner um, programs are fantastic to prepare you to be a practitioner, um, but knowing where you want to go, which I think what, um, what's been mentioned before too, is, is important before you do it, for sure. Yeah, I think those are all great points. I would say I also mostly had experience with practitioners, a few academics, but by and large for most of these programs, I think that will be the standard. Um, and those were some of my richest experiences in grad school. My favorite class was a class with John Kirby, who was State Department and Pentagon spokesperson. Now he's on CNN. Um, and he was just amazing. He would bring in John Kerry, Chuck Hagel, the head of the ISIS coalition. I mean, basically all of his friends. And we would just talk to them for hours, similar to Epic, um, with a group of maybe 10 or 12 students, um, just engaging with them. Another one was one of the top officials at the US Agency for International Development, USAID. He'd go to Kabul, you know, be meeting with the president, and then he'd come to our class the next day and would just have, you know, amazing experiences and really drilled us on our memos and briefing skills and things that, you know, he was doing day to day in his job. And so I found that to be tremendously helpful. Um, I will say, you know, coming from Tufts, you're coming from one of the best IR programs in the country, especially if you're an IGL student, you're gonna be really well versed in a lot of the academic foundations anyway. Um, you know, you, you've done your IR 101 class, you've done econ, you've done a foreign language, and you have a very strong foundation. So I would think about um, what is going to add to that. And again, if you have professional experience, you'll know specifically what are those skills that you need to dive into more uh, to get you to the next level in your career. Great, and one of the questions, um, you know, you guys mentioned the, the need for the masters, you know, kind of especially in DC and Maggie, maybe you can talk to that in terms of like kind of the humanitarian work and the development work, but also what's the difference? Um, would you recommend also pursuing a PhD? Is that necessary? Is a master's kind of a good level for the type of work you all kind of want to pursue, you know, how should, how should everyone be thinking about them? Uh, I think on the sort of NGO world, the uh, humanitarian response and, and development from the NGO side, a master's is pretty required in the same way that Rachel and Amy have mentioned. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, there's some program assistant or program manager, maybe, but beyond that, you often need a master's. Um, I think I saw a question too there about overseas. I think a number of people in, uh, of my colleagues have also done sort of the development program. There are a number of European um, and British development programs that are quite popular. LSE, Sussex, SOAS are um, common in the humanitarian world and I think recognized. Um, sometimes harder for a network if you're planning on working in DC-based NGOs, but in the larger humanitarian world, those, um, especially the British schools, are pretty well recognized. Um, I have found uh, a PhD is not, does not, I mean, there are a few people, for example, at CRS that have PhDs if they're like leading the technical area, but not generally required, but I'd be curious to hear what the others think about the DC world. I think if you're looking to transition to like a think tank or to back to academia, sometimes it does seem, it's not impossible to do with an MA, but um, 
but that seems to be more of the PhD world. Um, can I just add one quick thing to something that Amy said made me think about, um, or uh, maybe it was a previous comment about practitioners and, and sort of rich, uh, experienced faculty. I also think it's it can be very valuable to go somewhere where your views might be a little challenged, um, and where there's a diversity of thought. Um, I I definitely came from a super lefty liberal um, kind of perspective, and a lot of my friends were surprised that I went to SICE, which at that point was sort of considered somewhat conservative, especially because of the econ. Um, but I felt like it was really um, intellectually helpful to be challenged um, and to have to defend your positions and to learn to kind of merge those skills of, you know, making a position, writing a memo, but also kind of honing your worldview and being able to defend your positions on different issues um, in an environment where people are are presenting lots of alternate alternatives too. So I think some a place where there's like diversity of thought and where challenge is encouraged, I think can be really rich. I can comment on the PhD question in sort of the policy world. Um, I think Megan's right. If you wanna go into a think tank and kind of be settled down into a think tank as a scholar or a fellow um, in the long term, a PhD is important. But I have found very few other places where a PhD is necessary. Um, and I have thought about it a couple of times. So talk to mentors and supervisors and people who do have PhDs. And I'm constantly told it is not worth doing unless you really want to do it. And you know what you want to get out of it before you do it. Because the master's programs we're talking about are like two-year programs. But PhDs tend to be at least five. Um, and in government service, there are very few people who have PhDs. I think in the State Department has a, a Bureau of Intel and Research, for example, and there, there are probably more PhDs. Even in the intelligence community where you do, where a lot of your job is research and analysis, they will generally train you to do the research and analysis how they want you to do it. So having a PhD is not necessarily an advantage um, versus kind of coming up through their training programs. And I found in the Department of Defense, we did have some PhDs who came through for sort of one or two year rotations. And there was always a tremendous learning curve to understand the differences between sort of academic research and policy recommendations and policy action and sort of the use for information is different. Um, Amy was talking about briefing your boss on the way to the elevator. That is 100% a real thing. and if you're used to talking in paragraphs, it's really difficult to transition your mind um, to that. So not to say you don't learn a ton and develop excellent skills in doing a PhD, but I have not really found anywhere in the policy world um, that it's particularly useful unless you wanna be doing research, whether academic or, uh, or think tank type. Yeah, just quickly, I agree, they're, they're very rare. Um, it's really a very specific career path if you do have a PhD for research or teaching or something. What is maybe a little bit more common actually is joint degrees. So maybe a joint MBA, JD, MPP. Um, that's something to consider. Again, I, I wouldn't um, advise that just because you think the two are interesting, but really because there's a very specific need that you want to meet. Um, you know, a lot of my peers did, I think, mostly MBAs, and they also specialized in international development, and we're looking to bring those two together. But again, pretty rare, few and far between. Most people will just do the master's, and some will even do a shorter master's program abroad um, just to kind of tick the box even, um, like a one-year um, program abroad or something like that. Great. Okay, let me get some of these questions. So we started talking about it, but would you recommend going to grad school overseas in a region you are particularly interested in? I think it depends what you want to get out of it. I think we've all talked about the networks that we've developed. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be working in the United States, um, then the network you develop through one of the US based grad schools to me, I mean, for me, it's been very valuable. That's something to think about. Um, but if it is sort of more to 
check a box and just go somewhere interesting in order to get that degree on your resume, um, that may be a different question. And Megan touched on this. I don't know if she has other thoughts on the development world. Mm -hmm. Agreed, totally. Yeah, I think, I mean, there are a few people that I know that have like gone to VITS in South Africa or UCT or um, definitely the London schools or, you know, some of, they, they have specifics, but the network is definitely real. Like it's, uh, you know, my, my, my size cut, I graduated size in 03 and I still run into my classmates like all the time at meetings because <laughs> we're all sort of in doing the same kind of work. And so it's definitely a network for sure. I would almost suggest it might be better to do field experience or work abroad and then school in the city where you want to be working. I have a friend, for example, that went to Sciences Po, which is an amazing school, but it probably took her a year longer to find a job than my friends who went to Johns Hopkins SICE or other programs um, that were in the US. I think it can be really challenging and there's definitely you know, a lot you can learn from being in those places, but it may be more helpful to, to work there and then do school somewhere else. Great. Okay, another question. Uh, thanks so much for your valuable, insightful advice. My question is, do you have any tips on picking a regional versus thematic concentration? How did you guys decide? A satisfying answer, but it depends what you want to get out of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I well, think like you decided to go broader than the Middle East. Yeah, like, for me. Benefits? And what are the, you know, drawbacks and how do you look at schools that may have specialties like say, you know, Fletcher, which has a ton of great professors, but really, you know, hasn't had a focus, say, on um, Asia as much, you know, or hasn't, hasn't had professors that way. How do you look at that? Or how did you guys look at it? For me, I think, and we've all touched on like, what will grad school do that is additive to the experiences you've had? For me, I had had experience in the Middle East. I had learned a lot by reading things about the Middle East. Um, and I felt like I didn't need someone to tell me more of that. I wanted someone to help me figure out what framework all of that information goes into. Um, and for me, that framework, both some by design, some by what I ended up getting out of Georgetown, that framework was kind of the US national security policy making world. Um, and so taking courses that were broader, whether international finance, international security, um, I don't even remember the other topics. I think I took one class on the Middle East because the professor was a really notable person um, and I wanted the opportunity to study with him. But otherwise, I chose to do a lot of my papers on the Middle East. Um, so within the context of like a class on sanctions, I did a paper um, Think on Iran, although it was like Iran and Cuba, um, so comparison. But I would encourage you to think about what would be new and what would be different and what you can get out of school that you couldn't necessarily get elsewhere. For some people, that's going to be a regional focus, and for some people, that's going to be a functional focus. For me, something else I thought about in choosing Georgetown was because I wanted options still, I opted for a school that had a small program but a big university and a lot available within that university. So I looked at the courses that my program offered, but there were also regional studies programs where I could take classes from, I'm pretty sure they had something on every part of the world actually except Asia <laughs> at the time. Um, and although I didn't end up taking courses from all of them, part of my decision was I could, if that was something I was interested in. Um, there also was the undergraduate program. There were also work opportunities on campus. So kind of looking at the slightly broader world of the, the institution that my program was in, to me was an incentive um, to, to opt for that one. Yeah, I totally agree, um, especially with uh, Rachel's point about really pushing yourself to think like, what is the additive thing here? Like, um, there's so much interesting stuff to study. You know, I think it's really tempting to kind of get 
pulled into like, wow, especially if you're at a place where fascinating people are everywhere. You're like, I could take all of these classes on this region, I, at least in the development world, on the, uh, in the practitioner, development practitioner world and humanitarian world, I find a declining um, value in regional expertise. I think there's a lot more um, demand for people who have um, transferable skills across across regions and that have more specialization or deeper dive skills on things like you know uh, fragile states or um, the nexus between humanitarian and development contexts or you know in addition to the kind of traditional technical areas so I think if people are looking at development they should and also consider the other most common degree in um, in places like CRS is just an, an MPH, like a public health degree, or a specialization. We have a lot of agronomists, like people who have studied um, agriculture. So it, it seems like the split more now is between people who have sort of sectoral technical areas of ex of expertise, like health, um, farm systems, and agriculture. Um, or, or people who are more generalists like myself, you know, who have studied, um, more development processes, but have a couple of subsectors of areas that we have more experience in. So at SICE, I focused on, um, civil society was kind of my main area of interest, social change processes and civil society. And that's been a theme that, um, that has continued. And I think I layered under that similarly to Rachel, almost all of my papers were focused on Africa and most of my career has been in Africa or related to countries in Africa or African contexts. But I, I don't think that there's much of, I don't think you add much to sort of your market value um, if I had like a degree in African studies um, necessarily. I will add though language, is a plus so i think language is important to do if you're going to be doing some kind of, any kind of international work um uh at site at sice required uh, had a language requirement which was helpful um and i've used i've continued to to be to call on language skills and that's i think something that is in high demand continues to be in high demand um on the practitioner side i think if you yeah but i don't I'm trying to think of any of my colleagues that have stayed in one region or have been a regional expert. And the only ones that I can think of that had that actually left, got a PhD in something related to that region and are more like academic specialists in a country or in a region rather than um, sort of a functional focus. I think that's a great point. It's common for people to change regions. They might stay in the same functional area, but I've seen so many of my colleagues already switch to a different region just because of their job placement. I wouldn't stress too much about choosing between one or the other. It is important to know how to market yourself in your application, but I would actually, if you're looking at curricula, it's actually more important to think about your concentration. So are you a development person? Are you interested in security studies? Are you interested in finance? Um, and then, you know, those things will come as you're picking classes, as you're doing assignments, but think more about the skills you're trying to seek out in your education. And then that'll also inform which um, programs you select. Some are, you know, simply better at security studies than others. Some are better at um, quantitative analysis than others. And so I think that may help more uh, when you're picking schools. Great, great. And another question is, um, do any of the panelists have any insights on the differences between the curriculum and culture of graduate programs at Georgetown, Fletcher, and other foreign policy focused graduate programs? So, you know, each one probably takes on, like if you heard about SIPA or any of the others, you know, what made you pick what you pick and what, you know, may have made you move away from some of the others. I can speak quickly to that. I'm happy to talk offline too, if you're trying to choose between a few or, you know, kind of making those decisions. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but size is a huge factor. So for example, Columbia is much bigger than Georgetown's program. They're gonna have different cultures because of that. 
um, at Georgetown, I knew not only everyone's first and last name, where they're from, where they worked before, but what they want to do, what their family is like. I mean, you really get to know them quite well. Um, and that also, I think, affects the teacher-student relationship quite a bit. Um, for example, I had one professor who had a standing invitation every class to get beer or coffee right after class and talk about whatever you wanted to. If you wanted to talk about class or his experiences or your experiences abroad, um, he would just would always be happy to chat. Um, another kind of big contrast that you'll see is academic versus professional and more policy related programs. Um, so that's something important to look into. Um, and then again, I think the location also really affects um, kind of the flavor of what the school is like. In DC, you know, we always have speakers coming through from the State Department or world leaders coming through. In other places, you might have many more people coming in from the field. It really just varies. Um, but yeah, if you're trying to choose between them, um, they're all very similar. I'd be happy to talk offline and kind of walk through some of the nuances. I think maybe the one difference too is just how flexible the curriculum is versus how much what like the level of requirements. I don't know if this is still true, but like the size program's pretty rigid, like for better or for worse. For my case, I wanted that that push to do you know all the econ, um, but it forced you to really choose carefully what you were going to fill the rest of your time with. So there wasn't a whole lot of space for like exploring you know new areas of. Um, inquiry. So how much flexibility is there? Like how, what are the kind of requirements of the class, uh, the size? All of those are slightly different. Um, and just to go back to Amy's point about the, the um, network and geographic location too, um, because it does, I mean, it's not forever, but you know, the, the, the vibe is different and the community is different based on if you're in DC or if you're not in DC for sure. I would also just echo, I think it was Amy who made this point earlier, take a look at where people end up as a sign of what the programs tend to focus on um, and where they maybe funnel students to. Each one, and my information on each is a little bit outdated, but when I was looking at schools, each one did have a, like, a little bit of a niche, um, whether self-proclaimed or reputationally. Um, you know, SICE was the one where you had to do all the econ classes. SEPA was, as Amy said, bigger and also in New York. And New York was a huge draw for a lot of people. Um, GW is a part-time program. So, and Georgetown also has a couple part-time programs in their professional international security degree programs. So those are necessarily programs where the community is gonna be a little bit less tight because people aren't together all the time, but they make it possible for students to be full-time employees somewhere concurrently with school. Um, so it is worth kind of digging into to what is different. And um, I think talking to recent alumni of the program can really give you a sense of what the reputation is at a given time and also how the schools and their student bodies want to characterize themselves. Um, you know, at least when we were in school, SICE and Georgetown had the silly rivalry. Um, but each one was equally as wonderful of a school. You would just get a totally different vibe depending whether you talk to MSFS students or SICE students uh, about their own program and the others. Great, and um, all of you have talked about networking and I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about how you build those networks. You know, I mean, part of it is, you know, maybe your cohort or your classmates, but also how do you build the additional networks and how do you think about that going into grad school or while you're there? I mean, I think that's like the gift and it's, I mean, as we're thinking all about privilege these days, it's kind of the, it's definitely a privilege that comes with being able to go to one of these full-time programs is it's sort of handed to you on, on a silver platter in some ways, at least that was my experience. You're there together, you're having this extremely intense experience together. Um, you're all interested in the exact same things. And then you do kind of all end up doing similar kinds of jobs um, on a similar timeline. So it's interesting as I look back, you know, now over 15 years, like 
you could see the waves of like all of us went overseas for a few years and then like people started to trickle back to to dc and now we're kind of you know in mid to senior level positions at ngos and so it's it's sort of handed to you in a lot of ways um but i think if you're not doing a full-time program, it just means that you have to probably be more active and put in the time to really just spend on relationship management or like invest in relationships. And, and that includes faculty. I think um, Amy's point about like having people around who are willing to hang out with you like that, that's a gift that you'll never have again, really. I mean, you're really in, and I think Rachel's point about the kind of people that you're just coming into contact in some of these programs is, is is an amazing gift like you truly do meet people who are the experts on what this topic you know in the world and they're willing to talk to you and they're interested in you so i think recognizing that that is part of what the you're you're doing in these programs is learning from just being with your peers and with your your professors and actively participating in that community will probably yield a lot of benefits. I think you also learn not to be afraid to ask to talk to someone. And I mean, I learned a lot of this in the IGL with the research projects we did where I just emailed people halfway across the world who I had never met and who had certainly never met me. Um, there is, I think, unique to Washington, but also just in the uh, university world, a unique willingness to talk to people who want to talk to you and learn. Um, in DC, I found from my first experiences graduating after I graduated college that because it's such a network town, because everyone has the experience of someone having had a coffee with them and given them some advice when they were starting. And I mean, for me until today, uh, I just had a conversation with my current boss about, all right, what happens next? And can you help me start thinking about this? Um, because everyone has that experience, most people are willing to give it, pay it forward and talk to you. Um, something else I think is a little bit different about grad school than certainly college um, is your, your peers are not only your friends, you also kind of have to assume that they're your colleagues. And this, this quasi-professional personal world where you are partying together, you're studying together, you're hanging out late in the library together, but you're also likely going to be working together and someone is probably going to come to you for a reference about one of those many people. years later yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and if you remember like you know if you're nice you can separate the person on the professional but that your whole you know your whole world becomes sort of quasi-professional um i found this when i was dating in dc too and suddenly like how do you tell someone who you're going to see at work the next day? <laughs> you don't want to go out with them. Um, but it is something I think that you have to keep in mind. Um, and uh, if you play it right, and if you conduct yourself right, your network kind of builds itself. And you're in, I mean, to what Megan said about sort of the privilege of being in these environments. Once you're in it, it's yours to lose. Um, but you do have to think about sort of, your personal world is not necessarily as separate from your professional world as it once may have been. Um, that's all. And stay in touch with people. Try and stay in touch with people. Those are all excellent points. I'd say there's also a few things to think about in terms of networking that you can do now if you're thinking about going to grad school to set yourself up for success. I'd say the first is, you know, obviously, you know, do class visits and all of that reach out to professors. I reached out to a lot of professors uh, when I was looking at grad schools. One of them actually ended up referring me to five different people on the admissions committee and offered to write a letter. And that was not something I was expecting, but uh, was really helpful. So um, that can be advantageous. Every time you have an internship um, or a job, Find out where people went to school, ask them for coffee, and just hear about their experiences. That really helped me to see kind of where people end up from different schools. And also, you know, you find people that are going to be really honest about their experiences. That was really helpful. And then one piece of advice that I wish I had heard even earlier that I always give to current students or recent alums 
is try to get your name out there by getting published. This is something you can do in an internship or a job, but try to get your name out there um, on an issue, whether that's regional or functional that you're passionate about. Um, because when you do go to school, they're gonna ask for a list of publications and you're gonna wanna put something on that list, but it's also gonna help you get noticed by people in your industry. Um, and then once you get into school, you know, building that network just continues. It's really important. And I like, like not to think of it as networking, but just getting to know people, ask people for coffee, ask about their experiences and companies they've worked in before. How do they like them? Would they recommend them? Um, because those people are going to become your recommenders. They're going to become your best friends. They're who you call when you need to brief your boss the next morning. Um, you know, on an issue that you may not know about. So I don't think it needs, networking can get a bad rap, it can be stressful, but I think um, it's just tremendously valuable, especially in a community like ours that is just so small. Um, so I'd really just encourage you, um, even if it's scary, just send that LinkedIn message, reach out to people for coffee, um, and then pay it forward. Um, once you do get to that job or do get to that school um, to other Tufts alums and IGL alums. Great, great. Well, thank you guys for spending the hour with us. I think this was really helpful and um, it was good to see everybody <laughs> in the best way we can and hopefully we can see everybody in person soon, but thank you so much. So fun. So nice yeah, to yeah. see you and nice to meet you guys and hope yeah, everybody's doing well. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye.